Welcome back fans. For this Azure Data Factory tutorial focused on mapping data flows, I'm going to talk about how you would take your ETL that you wrote in use SQL and use with Azure Data Lake Analytics. How you would move that into the Azure Data Factory mapping data flows environment. So ADF allows you to do both. You could orchestrate your code, your use SQL code as ADL A activities within pipelines, or you could produce those ETL processes with the uh, code-free visual environments now within Mapping Data Flows. So the data flow that I have on my screen is an example of an article from SQL Server Central uh, that is uh, explaining or a um, demonstration of USQL ETL. And this is how it looks in Data Flow and Data Factory. So let me go over to that article. Uh, I'll put the link to the article in the description for the video. Now, this is by Mike McQuillan from SQL Server Central. And this is a uh, tutorial on how to, to uh, do your ETL, ready, uh, write your ETL using your SQL. So you code, you code this and then you execute these scripts. So let's take a look at this code block right here uh, at the beginning. So essentially what he's doing is taking a uh, postal code file. So these files that he uses in this tutorial are the Download links are all in the article, so you can download those from there. I downloaded them, and then I, I put them into my Azure Blob Store. Um, you, could use, you could use ADLS if you prefer. I just happen to use Blob Store for my example. So what he's doing then is he's extracting out these fields from the file, postcode, total, males, females, number of households. So we're going to have some, demogra some very simple demographics information. And then as we select the values out of the file, we're going to filter those by... Uh, any postal code that starts with M12, put those into a file, and we should also say that we're also going to order these by the total field descending. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at how you do that in a data factory data flow. So the first thing we do is we set up a source, and the, the bottom stream here is the second example from the USQL tutorial. I'll go to, over that in a minute. It's on a separate uh, page. Let's look at the top stream. So the first thing we do is we set up a source. And the source is going to be that same CSV file uh, that Mike had. And so I downloaded that and I created a data set. So the data set defines the location and some information about the data set. Now with the data flow, I don't need to define the schema. Um, but in this case, what I did was I included the schema, but you see there's nothing shown here. The reason for that is it only shows you the number of columns because the file that I put here in my blob store has no headers. So because there's no headers, there really is no schema associated with it. There's just these these placeholders, prop or column or whatever they happen to be called. So the schema just says, yep, we got five columns. What you do then back in your data flow in the source transformation is that you then set under the projection. You can set things like the, uh, uh, you can set the data types and you can change the column names. I'm going to leave this all here. The Because this is a CSV text file, all the data types come in defaulted to string. To change these, you just click Detect Data Type, and ADF set those as short for me because it uh, sampled the data, looked at the data, and, and found out that it is a string format. Now, um, if you don't like short, you'd rather have those converted to int, you can either do it manually, or you can click on Define Default Format, and you can say, for my uh, numerical whole numbers, make those integers. But I'm fine with short. Okay, great. Now, what I did after that was I, I wrote a select. So a select transformation, which is what I added next, so I click plus and then select, is very similar to the, uh, the select query, the portion where you pick the columns, so the column selector. Now, here is where, in the select statement, here is where I go and I change those column names. The reason I do it here instead of projection, I prefer this method because then if I were to change my data set later under source settings, the projection would change based upon the physical properties and attributes of that file. This way I can leave that alone, leave it separate, do a completely separate select projection transformation. So I set the names as it is in the article, postal code or postcode, total males, females, and number of households. Now the next thing I do is I do some casting. So you saw that the casting I allowed EDF to automatically set that. I did want to show you as well that you can manually cast through a derived column transformation and I so I cast the total I changed it from a short to an integer just to demonstrate to you how you can do that. I also preferred casting outside in a drive column as opposed to casting from the projection. Again, for the same reason as if you change your data set, then that won't get affected here. That allows you to create a less brittle, a, a, um, a data flow that is less susceptible to change and um, 
uh, doesn't incur some of the penalties that you have when, when your uh, files change formats. And also, to also protect against that, I've also set allow schema drift so that new columns can come in and this will still work fine. Now, the next thing I do is I do the filter portion of that uh, code. So that, that is in the where clause in the article. And the where clause was looking for um, uh, M12 uh, out of the first three positions of the postcode field. And we were ignoring case, so in that case they said two lower, so I used the lower uh, function. Now notice the difference when you convert from USQL, USQL being a very c .NET based language, object-oriented, to a formula language, so you have to uh, kind of reformat things a little bit. So we're doing the exact same thing, just with these function calls, substring, lower, from the first ordinal position to the third, look for M12 equals equals single quotes. When I do that, now on my data preview, I can see that I'm only getting the M12 postcodes. Now to get this interactive sampling of the data as you are working in Dataflow, make sure that you have your Dataflow debug turned on, then you can click on the data preview tab. So what you can see is each of these transformations has a data preview tab, and you just click refresh to get that data preview live. Some of these I had already refreshed from my tests of my demo. Um, and what happens then is as you go through these different transformations, you can see the data change as you go through. So you see this is the initial data from the source, which has all the different postcodes. And by the time I get to the filter, now I only have the M12s. So the next thing they do is they do order by. So the ordering within a select statement is the same as a sort. So you go to, right, you click on your plus sign and you select sort. Now the sorting, uh, I apologize, I'm on the wrong transform. So the sorting is the field of total and it was descending. So I just say total and descending. And then you see in the data preview that the data is uh, sorted by total descending. The last thing they do is they sync it to a, you to land the data, output it to a file. So I created a sync transformation and in there I go to a folder. So the way to do this within Dataflow uh, to output a CSV file is to just point to a folder. So all my data set does is points to a folder in my blob store accounts. And I say that I want it to be common delimited, so CSV. All right, that's the same thing as in the SQL code. Now to set that to a specific file name, you just click on settings, click on output to single file, and then you put in the file names. This file name I just scraped, I copied and pasted from the article and put it in there. So the mapping of the uh, fields in the columns, I'm just gonna leave as auto mapping because those all those fields are the ones that we wanna land in the file. Now, as you're here in your um, uh, in your designer, your Dataflow designer, let me switch to hide graphs so that we're in full mode here. I'll go to my data preview tab on here. You can look at the data preview and you can look at the data as it's going to land. When you're in debug mode in the Dataflow designer, no data is actually landing in any of the files. So nothing is being written. This is just a snapshot of data as it exists at this time in memory. Essentially the data frames, you're seeing, you're viewing the data frames within the uh, Spark cluster that is being used in the background for this. So the Dataflow debug button is what turns on that cluster for you. Now, if you like this environment immersed within this, you can always just go through all the different transformations uh, left to right within your graph, and you'll be able to see the data preview of each of those. So you can see the data change as it goes throughout the process. So to be able to write this data and to test it out, we actually need to go to a pipeline. So the pipeline is the um, entity within Data Factor that executes everything, including the data flows. So if you go over to my pipeline, which is called execute USQL, and then you just pick that data flow, which was uh, the data flow name was USQL. And we're in, we have debug on, so we can click debug. When you click debug, this will actually execute this and we'll write the data to a file. So I uh, did mine before the demo and it took three minutes and two seconds to run through all of the different streams within that data flow. The second stream on there actually queries multiple files with wildcards, so it takes a little bit longer to accumulate those files and to process those. So three minutes and two seconds, uh, end to end, and then you can click on the eyeglasses. The eyeglasses will give you the execution plan. So if you're familiar with USQL and executing those through ADLA, you're probably uh, comfortable with the, the execution view that you get within ADLA, which is a graph of the execution of your transformations and of all the steps within your uh, USQL code. Very similar here within Data Factory. So we give you this view so that you can see the number of rows that pass through each transformation, how long each stage within this transformation job took. If you click on the sync, we'll give you additional information such as the partitioning of the data, the skewness, uh, essentially the distribution of the data across those partitions. Now notice how the um, 
time that it took for the data with once it was in memory and spark to pass through transmission was very very fast about 16 seconds by the time we got to the sync it took two two and a half minutes because now there's io involved and in this case i asked spark to take all those different partitions each of these would have been a different part file that was output i said take those part files and coalesce those into a single file that's what the useql was doing and that's why you get the two minutes and 30 seconds to do that all right, great. So that's that's stream, and that's how you execute this. Let me actually show you, by the way, the end result. So I go over to my Azure Explorer, and I see that this is the output folder, and there is the file. If you double click on it, and then you can open it up in CSV and Excel, and you do see there's the M12 postcodes, and there are all the demographics for each of those postcodes. Now let's look at that other stream. So the other stream within the um, the sample. Let's go to the tutorial from the. Um, SQL Server Central, let me go to the next page, and then we'll finish it up here. So in, in this case, what he's, what Mike was doing is taking multiple files and using a wildcard. So a very popular feature within uh, USQL was this wildcarding capability. And we have this in uh, Mapping Data Flows as well. So we'll do a wildcard of all these files. And then what we're gonna do with this is we're going to do an aggregation. We're gonna do a count, and we're going to group it by OA code. We're gonna call that count total. And then we're gonna put that to a file called OA code total CSV. So how you do that in data flow. Now notice in, in mapping data flow, I put this all within the same data flow. You don't need to. These could be separate data flows. I just made it simple for the demo. So for multiple sources, what I did was I um, again pointed to uh, just something generic. In this case, I'm not pointing even to a file. Um, let me go ahead and show you the data sets. And the data just points to my container, and that's it. All right, I'm using the same link service, so the credentials are the same. But the reason why I just point to a container is because I'm going to use the wildcard as well. So my wild, my files are in sample data slash use SQL, and I'm using a slightly different variation on the wildcarding than the demo the t tutorial has. So I'm saying postcode sm under two star dot csv, but it's the same effect. And then what's really neat in data flows is I can say tag each row with a the value of what file name was found. So I can match up the values in the row with the file name where they came from to get some lineage on that. And so if I go to my data preview and I bring this guy over, you can see that there is what the data looks like and this is what each file that was found through a wildcard was and this was the row that it came from. So you get some lineage there. Now the next thing I do, let me actually go back to my data preview. The next thing I do is that you notice that each of these um, columns is marked with this uh, drifted the schema drift icon. The reason for that is because I have no projection on here. Um, I'm not bringing in any schema from the data sets because I'm assuming that some of these schemas could be different as I run this. So when I do that, what I can do is I can go to my data preview and click this uh, uh, map drifted button. What that does is allows Data Factory to automatically create a projection for you. So it creates a derived column. This is all auto generated. Um, I have on here to um, any uh, uh, to allow schema drift in any schema drifted column to infer the data type automatically, so I don't need to click that button. And that's how it's able to say, look for these names. Um, these are each of the names within that's um, the discovered columns, and create a column for it of this type. There's the short, and there are the strings. So all that is done automatically through Data Factory. Now all I need to do is build that aggregation. Very simple aggregations. I use an aggregate transformation. You click plus aggregates and when you add that the grouping is going to be by the OA code and then the aggregation is just a total so total count one is what I use to get the same effect as the SQL code now I added I included my file name in there because this is an aggregation so you always need to have every column that you want to include as the output included I just say give me the first row that has the file name in it because that'll give me the file name for all the rows associated with that aggregation. When I look at the data preview, I get exactly what I'm looking for. There's each of the files associated with each aggregation. So for postcode um, E blah 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 7432, there was a total of two and they came from that file right there. And then of course I sync that. The syncing is no different here. This is going to the uh, exact same folder outputs, just a different file name. This file name is the OA code underscore totals.csv. And that's it. That's how you would migrate that use SQL to visual code-free environment in Azure Data Factory.